Thank you everyone for coming. We've got a really good turnout tonight. I'm impressed. Um, my name is Tanya Van Camp. Some of you maybe have seen me speak before. Like many of you, I was not really, didn't have zoning on my radar until the recent events developed in Caroline. And after reading that initial zoning proposal, I started delving deep into research. In my forays, I discovered that there was a new book about zoning that was gonna be released in June. So with much anticipation, I pre-ordered Nolan's book, Arbitrary Lines, and it arrived just in time for me to read it while I was on my vacation this summer. My brother accused me of being a nerd, and I guess I'll accept that. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce to you, Mr. Gray, to you. He is currently the research director for the California Yimby. He was a professional city planner in New York City who worked on zoning policy, a scholar with the Mercatus Center, and is working toward a PhD in urban planning at the University of California. In addition to his recent book, Mr. Gray has been published in The Atlantic, The New York Times, Forbes, Bloomberg, and City Lab. He has graciously flown out here on his own dime to share the knowledge and insight from his extensive career with us here in Caroline. This event is an opportunity to hear from an expert in the field and ask questions, which I know many of you have. In an effort to maintain civil discourse, I respectfully ask that you hold questions until after his presentation. There will be a Q&A time during the second half of the hour. So without further ado, I present to you Nolan Gray. How's everybody doing? Out here on a Monday to hear about zoning. Let's hear it. It's been exciting. <laughs> Normally, uh, people are at these talks because they're students, and uh, to get their attendance credit, they uh, have to come to them. <laughs> so you will all get your attendance credit. Um, it's 50% of your grade, so congratulations. Um, my name's Nolan Gray, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be speaking here. Um, as Tanya said, I just wrote a book on zoning, and uh, so much of it is theoretical. Uh, and then, of course, I hear about the discussions happening in here in Caroline, and it's, it's really touching on a lot of the stuff that I'm dealing with in the book. I'm gonna talk about a couple things here. Um, 30 minutes of, of, of lecturing, if you'll allow me, uh, and then 30 minutes of Q&A and community discussion. Um, so, first two elements I'm gonna talk about today, what is zoning and where it comes from. Um, I'm gonna talk about what went wrong with zoning and, and why it matters, uh, even in uh, rural communities. We so often think of this as just a, a city issue, but of course here we are in Caroline dealing with this issue. Um, and then what does all this mean for Caroline? What does it mean for you specifically? Um, what is zoning? Uh, so I will uh, let you all know, this is the most boring part of the talk, if you have to go to the restroom, uh, it's in the back. Um, what is zoning? Um, this is a quote from Judge David Westenhaver from the, the district court decision for Euclid v. Ambler. This was the 1926 case that ruled uh, zoning to be constitutional. Um, Weston Haver uh, actually uh, held that zoning was unconstitutional and was later reversed by the Supreme Court, a decision in which they called apartments mere parasites. Uh, Judge Weston Haver said, the plain truth is that the true object of zoning is to place all property in a straitjacket. What does that mean? Um, so with zoning, of course, uh, there's two big elements here. There's the zoning ordinance and the zoning map. What zoning is doing is it's taking every single property in a city and assigning it to a zoning district. That's the map that you can see on the right there. Um, then for each one of those zoning districts, it's placing a whole bunch of rules on what you can and can't do on every single parcel in those uh, districts. Um, it's doing two things. The first, there's two big pillars to zoning. The first is, is very, very, very strict use rules. So it's saying on some properties you can have residential, on others you can have commercial, on others you can have industrial. Easy, right? It gets much more complicated in practice. In your typical zoning code, there are gonna be uh, uh, multiple, if not dozens, of different commercial districts, multiple different residential districts. The Caroline Code, as written, uh, is quite a bit simpler than that, but these things start simple and they get much more complex. Um, so that's the first big pillar of zoning, is it's saying planners are gonna say for every single lot in a city what the allowed use is, and, and the specific type of use. So on some lots, we might allow single family homes. On other lots, we might allow apartments. It's at the discretion of the planners. Commercial uses, of course, very, very, very detailed. Most of these codes will have lists 
of all of the exact permitted uses that are and are not allowed. So it's very highly prescriptive. Second piece is setting a whole bunch of rules for the density allowed on every single lot, or the amount of floor area that you can build, and what that actual building could look like. Um, so, for example, it's a lot of people know about stuff like height limits or setbacks, that how far setback from the street of a development has to be. But there are a whole bunch of different rules that just sort of, I would argue, in an arbitrary way, say, well, you could, the building can only cover 20% of the lot, or the building can only take up one multiple of the total lot size. So, for example, if you have a uh, a 10,000 square foot lot, your floor area ratio might be 0.5, and you can only build 5,000 square feet. Um, that's pretty high relative to what's likely to be allowed here. Um, I would stress too that these codes are basically, they're completely different from what most people think of when they think of building regulation, which is building codes. Uh, building codes are adopted at the international level and then at the state and local level. They're optimized around the actual health and safety of the building. In many cases, of course, as the title of my book suggests, these rules are somewhat arbitrary. They're arbitrary restrictions on the amount of floor area you can build on any given lot. Um, I would stress here that this is zoning is a small part of a larger ecosystem and planning. So, of course, humans have been doing city planning <coughs> since basically we started settling down, right? So planning out street grids, planning out where the parks are going to go, planning out sewer and water. Um, zoning is a very small subset of that, and it really is about segregating uses and restricting densities. Even within land use planning, there are other parts of land use planning. So there's stuff like historic preservation, or there are rules for subdivision regulations. Many cities uh, or many jurisdictions have those rules and they don't have a zoning district. They don't, they say, we, we, maybe we wanna have some historic preservation or we wanna have some rules for breaking small lots into larger lots, but we don't wanna do systematic use segregation. We don't wanna tell every single property exactly what's allowed on their property and at what scale. Um, so what went wrong with zoning? Uh, this is a really amusing picture from, from West Los Angeles where you have these high rises next to single family homes. Um, in my current position with California Envy, we spend a lot of time talking about the housing affordability crisis. I don't know if you all heard, but California is pretty expensive. Um, it's partly because California has some of the most restrictive zoning in the country. Um, of course, we started with fairly liberal zoning, not unlike what's on the table here. And then, of course, over time, it gets much, much, much more restrictive. Um, zoning has really underwritten, in many ways, the current housing affordability crisis across the country, to varying degrees in different contexts. Restricting new supply, uh, mandating higher costs, uh, et cetera. So here's Los Angeles, this is a typical U.S. city. Um, in something like 70% of the city, the only thing that you can build is a detached single family home, can't build duplexes, can't build townhouses, can't build small apartment buildings. Um, in many cases, actually, it, it, it's actually criminalizing or rendering I illegal duplexes, for example, that already exist. And I'll talk about more about that in the context of Caroline. Another thing that zoning does is it forces the housing that is built to be more expensive than it might otherwise have been. So in a suburban or a rural context, of course, I'm sure a lot of you all have heard a lot about this, minimum lot sizes. You have zoning rules that will say, within certain areas of the city, um, we're gonna require that each parcel, each property sit on a lot of at least a certain size. And if the lot is, is not that, if it's not large enough, then we're just not gonna allow you to plot it. We're not gonna allow you to build a home on it. Um, effectively, what that does is that places, that places a price floor on housing, because of course land is, generally gonna be about a third of the cost of a new home. So if you can mandate a really large lot, you can basically put a price floor on housing and you can say that certain types of people are not allowed in this area. And that's how zoning's been used, and I'm gonna talk about more, more about that in a minute. In cities, it's not so relevant in a place like Caroline, but in, in, in many cities you have similar things going on with parking requirements, where uh, if you go into maybe a city like Rochester or a city like Syracuse nearby here, and you say, you know, why, do, why, do all, why does all the new commercial development have these huge parking lots that even on Black Friday, aren't even 75% full. In many cases, it's because you have zoning rules that require a whole bunch of parking to get built. And in the context of housing, of course, that really can raise housing costs. If you have to do a parking structure, you know, the cost can quickly get up to fifty to $80,000 added to a unit. Again, not, not so super on, uh, on, the on the table with Caroline, but it's an issue. And it's a, it's a type of issue that I think does come up in the code that we're talking about in this community. The third, and this is certainly going to be relevant, is that zoning adds a whole bunch of delay to the process of building just about anything. But in the context of housing, delays housing, which increases costs. So, for example, what you get in many jurisdictions, such as New York City, where I used to work, um, you know, uh, the zoning doesn't allow much of anything to be built as of right, meaning you can go in and get your permits, you know, basically within 24 hours. What you have to do is to go through these discretionary processes, such as site plan review, or to get a special use permit, or to request a rezoning, or to get a variance. And those things can take quite a lot of time. You know, Depending on the local processes, it can take six months, it can take two years. 
Uh, it's a huge delay for the process, and of course it's very expensive. Um, again, depending on local context, in many cases folks have to lawyer up, they have to hire an environmental consultant, they have to hire a planning consultant. It's very expensive. Um, one of the last projects that I worked on at New York City, and this was where I was really like, I gotta get out of here. Uh, I had a doctor who owned a doctor's office. He had a, he had a small, he was operating a small medical lab out of the back of his home, um, right? Doing blood tests, typical thing you might expect in the doctor's office. But the zoning rules said, well, you're in a C1-1 overlay, medical labs aren't allowed. You need to get a rezoning to a C1-2 overlay. That gentleman was having to spend 50, 60, $70,000 to change his zoning because he wanted to hand the property over to his son who was also a doctor and when he went into the bank and said, I want to transfer this title, the banker said, well, your property's not conforming. Your property's illegal. You need to go and get the zoning sorted out. So these things real, have real consequences. You know, delay is not free, and it can place a huge burden. And in many cases, it can just force people to reconsider undertaking projects altogether. Right? We talk a lot about the projects that get delayed or the projects that get canceled. But I think the real cost of these delays are that many people just don't undertake their dreams. Maybe they don't start their business because they know it'll be a huge process. Maybe they don't, they don't build that additional home uh, uh, on their property that they might otherwise have. Um, and then of course you get the NIMBY phenomenon, which, uh, oh boy, um, if y'all don't already know about it, it's coming, right? And it's a huge issue in California. And what you do is when you set up these processes, um, it becomes very easy for folks who have extremely restrictive land use preferences to show up and dominate these meetings. And essentially, regardless of what the law says, results in a situation where it's very hard to build anything. And it gets very personal, it gets very political, it's very messy. A couple other points I'll make, which I discuss in detail in the book. If you want to hear about all this, of course, go out and buy an armchair line. It's only $30. Uh, it's probably worth $50, so you know, it's pretty good deal. Uh, I think another important thing that gets lost, and it's, it's sort of been coming up recently, is the way that a lot of these rules really are rooted in attempts to segregate cities. Um, in many cases, based on race. Uh, but at the very least based on class. So in the U.S. context, many U.S. zoning codes come online in the 19-teens and 1920s. And why, why does that happen? Because in 1917, the Supreme Court says to uh, Louisville, in my home state of Kentucky, you all might have heard, by the way, I'm a coastal elite, I'm a coastal planner, you know, I come from the big city, from Kentucky. Uh, <laughs> bunch of junk. Um, from the bustling metropolis of Lexington, Kentucky. Um, but the Supreme Court said to Lowell, well, no, you cannot explicitly say white people are allowed to live here and black people are allowed to live here. And so what cities do in the aftermath of that is they start adopting a lot of these zoning rules that say, well, we're not going to do that, but we all say if you want to live in this part of the city, you have to be able to afford a home on a, on a two-acre lot. And if you want to be able to live in this part of the city, we'll allow you to live on a one-acre lot. Or if you want to live in this part of the city, maybe we'll allow townhouses here. The ability to determine what gets built where is the ability to determine who gets to live where. And cities use this power to segregate cities along socioeconomic lines. Uh, and even zoning codes that might not necessarily start out doing this gravitate toward that. Uh, I'll, I'll flag this on the left because I think this is a, the picture on the right is a great irony, right? Um, this is a picture I took from Austin, Texas. Um, they do have color in, in Austin, but I <laughs> somehow ended up in black and white. On the left here, you have one of these signs, that all are welcome here signs, right? Uh, started propping up in the Trump era. It's a very nice sentiment, no problem there. I think it's a, it's a nice thing to do. But then right next to it is a sign uh, of the homeowner saying that they oppose a change to the zoning code that would allow for more housing to get built. And I think people don't really realize the tension here that their stated values is they want to live in communities that are equitable and affordable where young families can afford a home to stay in the community, where folks of all socioeconomic levels can afford to live. But then they go out and they push for policies that do precisely the opposite, policies like zoning. Third is I'll say too, I think you know, another issue that's, that's relevant in, in this discussion is the relationship between zoning and sprawl. So as I'll talk about in the context of Caroline, just about the only thing that the zone isn't super antagonistic toward, other than the stuff that the state government doesn't allow them to regulate, uh, is really large lot single family homes. Um, if you wanna build maybe a row of townhouses, if you wanna build maybe a small apartment building, if you wanna build a detached, accessory dwelling unit so grandma can live in it as she grows old or if your young adult children can live in it while they raise money for a down payment. All that stuff can add additional process, right? And this is really a part and parcel of what zoning is doing is where it's, it's really prescribing the nature and the form of cities, the, the form that they can take. Um, you don't get the little hamlets that are spread around Caroline uh, under zoning. You don't get those little clusters of shops and maybe a mixture of single family homes and a couple duplexes, the types of healthy communities that would just emerge over time and 
prevented homes from maybe spreading out into prime farmland or into natural areas. In many cases, zoning doesn't allow that. And in fact, certainly that's the case with the, the code as written today. Now for the fun stuff. That's the, uh, that's the talk that I give to everyone. But this is, this is prime special material here. This is all about Caroline. Um, so of course, you all are in the middle of a process of adopting potentially zoning for the first time. Uh, I've heard it's, it's been very calm and everyone's been level-headed. <laughs> uh, there's been no arguments. Everyone agrees. But I'm still going to give a couple thoughts on this. Um, so of course, there's, there's still revisions ongoing. and I've had a chance to look at, at the code as it exists today in the map. And I wanted to provide a few quick thoughts about what this will mean. First is the use rules. Um, this, this, this uh, as I mentioned earlier, this zoning ordinance allows some of the agricultural uses that state right to farm laws protect. Uh, it allows large lot single family homes, um, but just about everything else, and certainly any commercial use, is gonna require a ton of additional paperwork. It's gonna require a ton of additional process. It's gonna require the approval of a very small number of your neighbors, um, only with permission, right? So these are the what they're calling the abbreviated site plan review. Stuff like that detached accessory dwelling unit, that detached granny flat, uh, major home occupations, animal feed, any kind of farm market. If you wanna have an artist studio, if you wanna build a church on your property, that's gonna involve site plan review, that's gonna involve costs. I'll talk about more that, about that in a minute. Um, even more uh, paperwork, um, maybe campgrounds. If you wanna take a small part of your farm and turn it into a campground, that's gonna involve a special use permit. Um, if you wanna maybe have a restaurant, on part of your property. In many parts of Carolina, if zoning is adopted, that's gonna require a very difficult, very expensive, very costly, very complicated, and very unpredictable zoning approval process. And then of course, as is typical with zoning, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's just banned altogether, or uh, anything that's not expressly identified in the code is either banned or requires this very extensive uh, public process. Um, you know, I. I I think this stuff is, 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 is really important to think seriously about. You know, I think so. As written, there's some, there's some allowances for minor home occupations. But for example, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, uh, my mom was laid off. And um, she's uh, restless in the way that I'm restless, which is why I've flown out here to Caroline to talk about zoning. <laughs> and she started a small home-based business. Uh, and me being a precocious young planner, I looked it up, and her business was technically illegal. Um, if she actually wanted to get permits for it, she would have had to go and spend hundreds of dollars applying for permits. Um, if her neighbors, if her and her neighbors got in a fight, they could rat her out. Code enforcement could come out, it could be very complicated. Uh, and this is despite the fact that she was engaged in behavior that had no impact whatsoever on anyone. Um, so it's really important to think seriously about what we're making compliant, non-compliant, conforming, non-conforming. Now I did say that the current code allows some stuff. Um, just about the only thing, again, if, besides the agricultural stuff that's really just getting a lot of state protections, uh, is maybe a single family home on a three acre lot. Um, I don't have a problem with this. I would, I would like to live here. Anyone, anyone like to live here? I would like to live there. But I don't think it's the only thing that should be allowed in a city. Uh, when, you, when your zoning code only allows this type of development, you're basically mandating sprawl. You're only gonna get McMansions on large lots. Um, again, perfectly fine if, if, if someone wants to do that with their property, but I think you should have the choice to build maybe smaller homes on smaller lots, the type of things that would keep folks born and raised in Caroline in the community, the type of housing that's affordable for folks who maybe work on working farms here in the community. That type of housing is gonna be much more difficult to build because of a cocktail of rules that we can talk about more here in a minute. So as I was diving into this, a few interesting things. There seems to be a lot of stress here on minimum lot sizes when I was reading through it. Um, so of course, in most of the hamlet areas, and I'll show a map here in a minute, in most of the hamlet areas, there are minimum lot sizes. And these are, these are above and beyond what the county already does, where the county will already impose minimum lot sizes related to sewer and water. So to the extent that minimum lot sizes are actually important for a health and safety reason, that's already regulated. That's already fully regulated. Uh, and a whole bunch of the other environmental considerations like water or, or, or conservation, a lot of that's already regulated by the state, federal, or county government. This is adding just an additional layer of you know, I'm gonna use this word arbitrary again, uh, rules. Yeah. So these acre rules, and, and, and I've underlined, you know, they insist that, the, that there's no minimum lot size in agricultural rural districts. Um, there's a minimum of one dwelling unit per three acres. The average lot size have to be three acres. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, we're kind of splitting hairs on this one when they say there's no minimum lot size in agricultural rural districts. The mandate is still every single home has to have three acres of land. Um, so, 
I was kind of curious, like, what are these rules going to mean for what exists today? To what extent does this reflect what actually exists in Caroline? So here are your, um, here's the zoning map. Um, I was a little bummed when they canceled the, the meeting on, uh, what was it supposed to be, Wednesday? So I got extra motivated over the weekend and I just made the zoning map. Um, so here's the zoning map. I, I had a feeling they weren't going to share the shape file with me, so I had to make it myself. So here's the, here's the zoning map here. And, um, just looking at minimum <clears throat> lot size and density restrictions, these are all the properties, the red properties are all the properties that are gonna be non-conforming under the new zoning code. Oh, yeah. okay. Now this might look small because I'm only looking at minimum lot sizes and density. So I'm, I'm only really touching on the rules that are hitting on um, uh, regulations having to do with lots. Um, and this might look small, but when you zoom in, what you quickly see is this, this affects basically many of lots where folks actually live, right? So, so the large lots that are mostly like working farms or, 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 or wilderness areas, those aren't really affected, but many of the lots where folks actually live, where they own their homes are gonna be made non-conforming. And I, I really wanna stress that, that that's gonna add a lot of new process, that's gonna add a lot of new headache, a lot of new paperwork. It's gonna make it very hard for this community to grow and adapt and change over time. Uh, the way it has basically up until now, which is why it's you know become the great community that it is because it was allowed to grow and change. So you know here, here's a <clears throat> Bessemer and, um, and, uh, and and right around actually we're right in this area. So these are mostly you know many cases many people's properties are actually going to be made non-conforming and um, be curious if this applies to you. Um, you can pay me five dollars and I'll let you know. <laughs> um, no, just shoot me an email and we'll figure it out. Um, so what, what am I talking about here? What are these lots? What do they look like? What would be made non-conforming and what would be illegal to build under the proposed zoning code? Uh, here's a residential home in Bessemer on a one acre lot. Um, non-conforming, illegal to build from now on. Uh, there's a under one acre, uh, it's not allowed in Bessemer. It's some of the most restrictive of all of the uh, hamlets that I looked at. Um, here's something you all might recognize. Um, Non-conforming, sorry, for whoever would. Um, it's on a lot of less than one acre, it's a one acre minimum lot size. I want to be clear, they're not going to force these things to close, they're not going to come demolish your home, but you will be made non-conforming and it's going to be a headache to expand. You're going to have to undertake site plan review if you want to add any additions. Um, you don't want to be in this world, right? So a whole bunch of these uses too require special use permits. And something that I, I hear in this context and I hear in so many other contexts is, I hear planners say like, well, it's still allowed. We're not really banning it. We just are requiring it to get a site plan review or to get a, a special use permit. Um, I mean, that's like you know saying let them eat cake, right? Uh, like these things are not easy. They're not guaranteed. They're expensive. They're difficult. Um, in many cases, they can politicize small projects that that really should have been allowed as a right. Don't have any uh, impact on neighbors. Um, and realistically, I mean, if you actually crack open the code, and I encourage everyone to do this. Um, uh, you can see, I mean, there's really, there's a thousand different ways that, that the review board could reject uh, a lot of small, inoffensive things. Again, the types of developments and uses that actually the community needs to remain healthy and to grow and adapt uh, and thrive over time. Excuse me. Uh, of course, this also involves environmental review, state environmental quality review act, public hearings. Um, you don't want to be in this situation. Um, site plan review, there's a whole bunch of design provisions. So, you know, Generally speaking, if the review board doesn't want to allow something under site plan review, they can deny it. Uh, but there are certain things where they say very specifically, we're not gonna allow it. Here's a multifamily building that we passed by today. It's a beautiful day, by the way. Is this typical? No. no. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna try to back out of that, that home that I made an offer on, actually. Yeah. So here's an apartment. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, uh, this is uh, not conforming. Doesn't have enough parking. Even though it's right in front of a bus stop. Um, <laughs> Also, uh, you all might be familiar with this, also non-conforming uh, parking out front and uh, prominent use of metal on the, uh, on the exterior of the building. Um, and uh, and I, I have good news, it can only get worse. Um, this is something you commonly see is jurisdictions will adopt codes that maybe they respond to everyone who came up to the meeting and had a specific complaint. They'll say, oh, okay, like, Joe came and he was upset about, he wanted to make sure this use was allowed, we'll just give it to him. Uh, Suzanne came and she wanted the she wanted this setback or this lot rule to be this, we'll give it to her. But once these codes are adopted, they kind of take on a life of their own and they become much more restrictive over time. 
Um, to give you an example that I'm pretty familiar with, here on the right is the original New York City uh, zoning code. Uh, it's a little bit small, you'll have to take my word for it. Um, <laughs> One page. <laughs> how long do y'all think this was when it was adopted? Shout it out. 1919. How many pages? Three. Three? Oh, that's short. It was 12. It was 12. Um, now I don't even know if there's a page count, it's online. So it would presumably be thousands of pages. Actually, no, wait, we do still print it. We have four binders in the office that I think we would occasionally refer to if we were uh, feeling uh, like masochistic on a particular day. Um, these things grow over time. The code as it exists today might be limited. You might look at it and say, hey, this doesn't affect me. My home's, not, my home's fine, my home's conforming. The business I want to start is perfectly fine. Um, I'm not gonna have to do site plan review. I don't need a special use permit. But that, not, that might not be true of your neighbor today, and that might not be true of you tomorrow. Uh, once these codes are adopted, that is essentially the course that they go on. They get restrictive, they get more restrictive over time, and they make it harder and harder for the community to grow and adapt and, uh, and, uh, and meet the needs of current residents. Um, I'm a city planner. I know some folks have been fussy about that. City is in the name, and they're like, well, Caroline's not a city. Uh, it's just a name, just a title. Uh, city planners work in rural context. Uh, all that's to say, though, planning is important. Planning is important. You need folks who are going to sit down and think through the infrastructure needs, stuff like protecting watersheds, uh, stuff like dealing with nuisances. That's all important work. Um, but so, so much of what's in this zoning code, as in so many zoning codes, has nothing to do with that. In fact, a lot of the stuff that's in this code is stuff that basically every other jurisdiction in the country is trying to figure out how to get rid of. That was partly why I wanted to come out here. So I'm, I'm seeing a city going in the opposite direction, and uh, freaks me out. Um, and it's bipartisan too, I want to stress. It's bipartisan, it's cross-ideological. This is not a red issue, this is not a blue issue. I know tomorrow's election day, so everyone's feeling politically charged. It's not a Republican issue, it's not a Democrat issue. I've talked to Republican state legislatures and uh, Democratic council members, and they're thinking about these things. They recognize, hey, we want to build communities that are affordable, equitable, sustainable, prosperous, resilient. Um, Fayetteville, right? The, the, zone, the, coding, the code as written is going to require parking. Many, place, many places are actually trying to get rid of the parking requirements because they stop the type of more incremental infill uh, that communities want. Uh, Gainesville, Florida, of course, cities are getting rid of these rules that ban apartments. And, and uh, under the current code as written, a multifamily would require a special use permit citywide. It's going to be a very hard process for that project to get that permit. And that's, that's in addition to all of the other environmental regulations that are already on the books. Um, Raleigh wants to raise and rebuild the community meeting, right? Many jurisdictions are realizing this, this process where every single application is this discretionary shouting match is not only just a bad way to plan, but it's deeply dysfunctional and really harms communities. I think we're, you know, I've heard folks say like, wow, we're in this big fight. We need to get through this zoning thing. We need, we need to just pass it or we need to just move on. Um, if you pass it, it's really just the beginning. It's just the beginning of multiple waves of fights like this. Every single project is now going to be politicized, it's going to be dragged out in a public forum, and it's going to be a big fight. It's not going to have anything to do with planning. Um, as I talk about in my book, um, and I, I really want to stress this, uh, planning and zoning are different things. Again, planning is important. It's important to have local governments that are dealing with a lot of these issues and that are, are, are tackling some of these challenges. But many jurisdictions go without um, zoning. Of course, the most famous example, the lar largest U.S. city, of course, this is applicable uh, to is Houston. Uh, I believe some folks have replicated the sign here. Houston, uh, zoning kills dreams. Anybody make that sign? Who made that sign? All that. The signs have been great, by the way. It was a blast driving through, driving in. <laughs> but I raise it here. You know, I, if you want to go learn the details, uh, definitely pick up my book. It's only thirty dollars. Amazon, local booksellers. Um, Got to pay for that plane ticket. Um, but I raise that here because it was it was almost an identical dynamic. Uh, that I see here in Carolina, where you had a small number of folks who were insisting, the people who were opposed, who had issues with something, you don't know what you're talking about, this is not a conversation you're supposed to be a part of, you know, this is just good government, well, you know, you need to, you guys are being difficult, why are you being difficult, Help, why don't you just tell us what you want the zoning code to say and we'll, we can get there. And there was so much reluctance from, in, in, in the case of Houston, mostly working class Houstonians of all races who said, no, we don't want this document. We don't want zoning at all. We recognize what this is. It's going to put our city in a straitjacket. It's going to make it hard to build the housing types that we need to remain affordable. It's going to segregate our city. Uh, and it's going to create generally an unhealthy dynamic. 
And there was just pure scorn. It's funny, you read the, the press clippings from the 1993 referendum, it's just the, all of the, you know, the, the editorial boards and the, all the smartest people in the room were like, oh, they just don't know what they're doing, they're ignorant. And you know, here we are in a case where in the US where now a lot of that stuff that I talked about in part two of my talk, that's totally the consensus. There's really no question that zoning is one of the main drivers of housing costs, that zoning was used to perpetuate segregation, that zoning basically doesn't allow anything other than sprawl. There's no question about that. And those people who were sneered at, actually they seem almost prophetic in what they were saying in 1993. And I think that's true here in Carolina. Again, there are important planning challenges. You need to make sure you're dealing with things like impacts. Of course, that can be contentious. And communities where you have working farms and industry, you gotta be smart about it. You wanna protect sensitive areas, that's all important. You want to have a plan for growth. You want to have a plan so we know, hey, we're thinking through the infrastructure needs of the growth that's coming. Um, but the response is not to just essentially put your city in a straitjacket, as the current code aims to do. To say, we're just going to make it very hard to engage in any housing growth that's not a large lot single family home. We're going to make it very hard to do any commercial development. Um, that is really putting your community on a path for deep, deep dysfunction. And it will only get worse over time. So. Uh, the rest of the country has made the mistake, um, but I think you all have a really exciting opportunity here to dodge a bullet, and I would strongly encourage you all to reject zoning. Thanks. <laughs> Happy to take any compliments, uh, <laughs> tips, <laughs> questions. One of the problems is we don't have a choice. Mm. They're going to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's tough. So, you know, part of why Houston was able to avoid it is that they actually had a mandate in their charter that it had to be subject to a referendum. I've been told that in New York, they legally can't do a referendum. I don't know about that. That's just what I've been told. Um, you know, I, I would hope that the political process will work. And the, because I mean, I'm, look, I'm driving around Carolina today and we're gonna be here for the rest of the week and seeing the signs. And I think there's nothing approaching a consensus. And I think it would be totally irresponsible to adopt the zoning code today. Um, it's, it's clear to me that there's no consensus. Um, you know, if the thing gets passed, I would say, you know, again, pursue political channels, uh, vote in people who I think share the values of most uh, folks in Carolina, and, um, uh, you know, this possibility to just remove the code. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry? Yeah, we were talking about that before. I, I actually don't know of a, of a community that adopted zoning and then immediately removed it. Um, there have been cases of, uh, of quick whiff waffling on not adopting it and then adopting it. But I need to do more research on this because it, it would be an unusual case for sure. Yeah. In the event that it's adopted, what about civil disobedience? <laughs> uh, well, I didn't use my employment affiliation today, so, uh, uh, you know, I mean, this is something that's, that ends up happening a lot of times with zoning is the rules are so restrictive um, and just so many folks are just operating out of compliance with certain rules and it just becomes impossible to enforce. Uh, my on the record advice is yes, everybody should obey the law. Don't put yourself in a situation where you're at risk of getting fines and stuff like that. Um, but. You know, I mean, if you adopt a really, really restrictive zoning code, it's kind of inevitable that folks will just, at a certain point, stop complying with it. Because, yeah. But for a follow-up, what's the process for them weaponizing zoning in the event of civil disobedience? How does the planning <laughs> process work? Does it get strapped down to your taxes, and then they, if you can't pay your taxes, they just come and repossess the house? How does that work? Um, so my understanding was there would be there would be fines assessed and there probably would be a lien on the property if you didn't pay fines. And then when you still disobeyed, then what? Well, you wouldn't be able to transfer the title if there's a lien on it. That might be right, complicated but, or refinance it. But so you're just going to give it to your kids anyway. You don't really care what the state says. You might not be able to transfer the title to your kids. Okay. Yeah. So then what happened? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Like, <laughs> um, Sure. I'm on the zoning commission. Um, uh, under the current rules, I believe that the first infraction is a fine of $200 a day, um, and 
there, if you're bad enough, it can be up to six months in jail. And if you do it again, then it goes to 300 months, $300 a day, and then maybe another six months in jail. There's, there's, a, whole, there's a whole section written okay. specifically about what the penalties are. I mean, are. imagine being in jail and they're like, what are you in for? And I started a bakery. <laughs> You're gonna get beat up on day one. Uh, you better make up a friend. But thank you for the context, ma'am. Is it true that uh, they would need a warrant to enter your properties if you don't give them permission? Um, these are questions that I would ask an attorney. I would, yes. Uh, generally, they would need a warrant to go into your property or or <laughs> pass a, any kind of blocked. Passageway. Yeah, a sheriff would also generally be present for anything like that. <coughs> Y'all are a militant here. I like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question. Sure. Um, since it was kind of already brought up, it's in your book, which I'll read for thirty dollars on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Is any of your research um, <coughs> into the cost of the taxpayers on mm. enforcing this? And I ask this because there's a lot of rules and a lot of regulations, and there's 130 pages of things. Currently, there is nobody employed at the town to enforce any of that. So there has got to be a staff to enforce that, which who pays for that. There's got to be a, a code enforcer or two or three. Um, then there has to be judges, more probably, to um, be on the bench to be a court for all these people that are getting tickets left and right. So anything on the cost that increases the taxpayers. And then I want to put on that is that the zoning also limits uh, new businesses to come here um, to benefit financially, right? So there's no, no offset for that cost. So if a store came here, they would be paying the taxes. That would help us residents. Since we're not going to have that, all cost goes to us. I'll tell you how they pay for it. They go out and start assessing fines. Right. So in most cities, uh, code enforcement or the planning division are considered revenue generating agencies. Where do they generate that revenue from? Everybody who wants a special permit or has to undergo site plan review has to pay a giant fee. Uh, or the code enforcer will go out and assess uh, uh, code violations against properties. Um, to your second question, yeah, I think the fiscal impacts are huge. I mean, this code, to me, as I've read it, is written from the ground up to stop commercial development in Caroline. Um, you, you know, so I've heard, yeah, Dollar General, huh? those guys. Um, you know, of course, you, you need workable rules to make sure that impacts are, you know, not harm, harming neighbors or, you know, that you have infrastructure in place, but you need commercial development to pay for public services, um, and especially in a context like Caroline, where, as I understand, the population is slowly going down, right? You need a, you need additional rateables. You need commercial development. Uh, is it going up? Yeah, okay. Uh, Has a Dollar General harmed a neighborhood that you know of? Uh, that I know of. Uh, well, I've never, I've never heard of a neighborhood that, that emptied out because of a Dollar General. Uh, no, I mean, jokes aside, I... I mean, I'm just asking yeah. because, you know, a lot of these towns, when I was growing up, a lot of these towns had grocery stores in them right. that no longer have grocery stores. you got to drive 20 miles to get to a grocery store. You, you know what I mean? <coughs> so, and well, I mean, what, my no, question had yeah. a point, you know, <laughs> is Dollar General you know, harming the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I don't see a harm there, you know, and that's, it helps poor people. A lot of people think, you know, harming our so anyways, yeah, we, I mean, know look, how, we know how this all started, how they stopped growth completely because of a dollar general. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, you know, I, I think, you know, what, what this always gets couched as, oh, we want to, we want to preserve our local character. We want to preserve our local small businesses. Um, you know, that's all well and good, but folks have to have a place to buy groceries, right? Um, you know, when I was, uh, my, my grandparents uh, in Eastern Kentucky lived in a very small town with an even smaller population in Caroline, and there was a little local chain supermarket um, that mostly served working class people, and I'm sure it offended the aesthetic sensibilities of 
rich people who lived in the community, but you know what? That meant that folks didn't have to drive an hour for groceries. Um, what are your planning priorities, to my mind? Bars, um, we used to have two bars and two restaurants. We got neither now. So yeah. we we used to have mills, yeah. feed mills. That's why people sell so armory, no, no bars. <laughs> <laughs> all, that, all that's gone. Yeah. And the people that are going to donate haven't lived here all their life like several of these people and know what was here before mm -hmm. and to be afraid of development and commercially uh, you know commercializing the mm -hmm. area we don't have city water we don't have city sewer right um, I don't think it's going to happen if they're afraid of I think that's a really good point I mean a lot of the boogeymen that are trotted out to justify this are you know <laughs> major commercial slaughterhouses or huge subdivisions or, you know, we're going to get a, what's the supermarket around here? Uh, uh, so what if you get a dollar general? Well, Big deal. It's going to help the area. You're not going to have to drive to Ithaca. What I'm getting at is, 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 is there are reasons why you're, those, those developments are just not like coming into Carolina, right? And the, the, to, to present the, to say, well, we want to, we want to uh, stop this theoretical slaughterhouse that might come in. So we're going to require the lady that wants to open a bakery to get a special permit. Give me a break. Come on. Right. Um, it's, I, I think it's, I think a lot of the reasons that are presented, as in so many cases for zoning, I think a lot of the reasons uh, that are offered for adopting the zoning code don't reflect what's actually in the code. Ma'am. Speaking of water and sewer, is it very likely that once zoning comes in, they'll want to uh, follow that up with municipal water and sewer? Is that typical? Um, well, so this code would, would actually restrict densities at a level above what water or sewer would typically serve you you know when you're talking one unit per three or one unit per three uh acres i mean that's you're just going to be on well and septic so i would i would say it's unlikely um yeah uh ma'am in the back there i've noticed that you've been speaking a lot about large population density areas mm -hmm. and you mentioned gainesville florida that's a city yeah. raleigh north carolina that's a city houston Houston's a mess, in part because they don't have zoning, and when Katrina came through, it flooded the hell out of the place. Now, if you look at other towns in Tompkins County, which is really the most realistic standard by which to judge how Caroline might grow and develop constructively, <coughs> all of the other towns in Tompkins County, except for Enfield, have zoning, and you don't have all of these expensive complications that you've talked about because those are endemic to big cities. You don't have it. No you know, way. Lansing has zoning, Groton has zoning, Dryden has zoning, Dance has zoning. There are still businesses coming in there. There is still protection from bad neighbors. You know, I have a friend who bought a new house. This was out in the Midwest. And the neighbors next door were um, semi-professional pyrotechnicians, and they would set off their fireworks at all times. She went over to say hello, and the first thing they said to her was, there's no zoning in this county. A couple of things on this. <laughs> zoning has nothing to do with fireworks. I've never seen any fireworks to do with anything in zoning. That, that's a completely separate ordinance. I, you know, many jurisdictions have ordinances for fireworks. So I think that's probably appropriate. When you that's an look instance. at the county, when you look at the county and the history of upstate New York development in towns, not in cities, but in towns, you know, you don't get all of the scare stuff that you've been talking about. Well, look at Lansing. Lansing. Sorry, but if your friends all walk up, but you can point them. We'll, we'll have a discussion afterwards here, but uh, I have a microphone, so uh, I'm going to... Um, Thank you. Yes, I would say, right, there are nuisances that need to be regulated for. If you've got neighbors who are blasting off fireworks every night, uh, I would suggest adopting a fireworks ordinance. Many jurisdictions have them. Many jurisdictions have ordinances for things like noise, things like traffic generation. Um, I'm not saying there's, that you don't ever do any form of regulation ever. I'm a trained and licensed city planner. I've worked as a city planner. There's important regulations. What I'm saying, though, is that sitting down and doing this systematic use, segregation, and density restrictions, that doesn't really get you what you want. That doesn't get you the neighbor who doesn't light off fireworks at 3 a.m. every night of the week. Um, so the point about Houston, Houston didn't flood because they didn't have zoning. Houston flooded because they got hit by a hurricane. Um, like every city in that region flooded. Maryland has zoning, 
and it flooded. Um, did, could Houston have done other planning initiatives better? Could they have diverted more development away from uh, areas that absorb rainwater? Absolutely, yeah, that's, a, that's an important planning function. Could they have done a better job designing uh, 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 infrastructure to accommodate flood flooding when it happens? For sure, they did make other planning mistakes, but actually to the extent that Houston doesn't have zoning, I think they were actually in a better position because they were able to very quickly redevelop a lot of these properties that in many cities actually would have been illegal to rebuild or would have been legally very difficult to rebuild. Mm -hmm. New York State already has construction rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's already a set of rules this big of how mm -hmm. you can build your house, whether you can screw your deck on or nail your deck on or tear your deck off because you screwed it on and you didn't nail it on. I mean, we already have all that crap. <laughs> you know, I know zoning is not going to fix that. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just going to tell you what you can do on your property. It's not going to tell you. You already have state laws about how far from the creek you can build. Yeah. You know, you already have that. You know, if you're gonna move into this town and you don't like the property next door because they got a pig farm, build your house somewhere else. Yes. My dad fought zoning for 40 years in the state of New Hampshire. It never passed till two years after he died. And it was because people from Massachusetts would come up and say, you know what, I don't like that pig farm and now we're gonna come into town and you're gonna have five acres to build on because we don't wanna see your little shack over there. Mm -hmm. Well, those people live there and that was their life. You know, we're getting that here. People don't like the cows, you know, <coughs> too bad, mm -hmm. you know? Don't, don't, don't buy here. Well, no, we have the same issue simple. with gun clubs here. Right. You know, you, we had gun clubs been there for 50 years. Well, now down in that other field, they sold it for construction and now you got 14 houses there that go, we don't want to hear the gun, the gun shop every day on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. You know, we have that here. So why did you build your house there? Right. You know, so that I, and that's what a lot is happening here. We have a lot of new people moving in. They already wrecked the town they lived in. Now they're coming out here and trying to do it here. Yeah, they themselves out, and then they come out here. That's okay, I came from Los Angeles and I have all the answers, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Did you bring your little homeless jacket? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sleeping out of the Prius so. <laughs> you, uh, you mentioned about rural character in, in uh, uh, Caroline, mm -hmm. and it was the fact that uh, Dollar General wanted to build here. Well, if this town board would get their head out of the sand, uh, out of the sand and look around, they'd find out that Dollar Generals in, in uh, this area and a lot of New York State make the rule character now. You got two in Dryden, you got two in Candor, you got Berkshire's got one, Cincinnati's got one. It's a part of the rule character because it, it's right there as a, uh, I don't wanna, it's not just a grocery store, I mean it's an all type of item store. Small Walmart that people can go to without having to travel 20 miles. Well, there, I think there's a subtle and important point there, which is community character is not a fixed thing. The community character changes over time, <coughs> changes to meet the changing needs of the community. And That's I think what I said, if these guys would get their head out of the sand, they might see that we want change. Yeah, ma'am. Um, so, I just wanted to um, address a couple things, and thank you so much for being here. I have, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. You can't hear me. I've never been told you can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> That's better now. You're okay. I can hear you. I'll repeat your points. Sweet. Hey, John. Um, so I really appreciate all the points you made. I have read your book. Um, those of you who know me know that I'm in no way here to defend at all the zoning draft that we have, but I do want to make a couple points of clarification based on um, a point over there about fear, which I think is really essential to be aware of as a really important contextual feature in our town right now. So um, the draft that we have, which ties me forward, because I picked it up today to refresh my memory, this is all we have so far is articles one through four. We know that, and um, Ernie can correct me, that I think by the end of the week, we might have the whole draft. 
But, no. okay, I was told today by Gene that we might have it. But regardless, it is coming. We don't yet have it. So right now what we have is Articles 1 through 4. And a couple of things that were raised in your presentation, parking requirements, prominent use of metal, and uh, a comment about that this is not a conversation that you should be part of, or that there was like a statement that the local um, government doesn't want certain people part of a conversation. And I just feel very compelled to say that that is not the case. It's never been the case. And those of you who know me know that we worked very hard to have some listening sessions in this very room, as well as in Speedsville, and as well as at the town hall, to hold exactly what you know we're trying to do here and listen. So I respectfully um, present that um, implication that anyone was told at any time that we don't want you part of the conversation. We want you part of the conversation. We need you to be part of the conversation. And I welcome you to continue to be part of the conversation. We can talk, but we won't be listening. So, so this is exactly why we're a little bit in the place we are. So um, the other thing I want to comment on is that the design standards in terms of like metal, parking, facade, planting, lawn, bushes, all that stuff is not in this. <laughs> No, Believe not. me when yeah, I tell you, it's not in I was, I'm operating off the first draft, so that's right. all I have. So what I'm asking of you, what I'm asking of you respectfully, as an elected official who cares about every single one of you in this room, and all of the people who are not in this room, and you can believe me or not, but I'm here, so I'm doing the best I can. It's unhelpful, it's unhelpful to make comments about things that we simply don't know yet. I, as much as all of you, really want to see the whole draft. <laughs> I really do. And we don't have it yet. So I think that there are really important conversations clearly to be had. I mean, I've had your book since the beginning, and I've read the whole thing. You can change it with a simple fold. You can change it with a simple fold. So thank you for your kind patience and listening and compassion on this issue. You know that. And I continue to serve you as best I can. Serious question. Serious question. Can we, can we, sir, can we please hold it till the end? So, a couple things. If, if you really want to hear from all of us, then before the zoning is passed, pass a referendum that the zoning needs to be voted on. I wish I could do that. Can you can't, I can't do anything about New York State law. Nolan, if you can help me out, I can't do anything about New York State law, right? Yeah. I, correct. Correct. New York State law says we can't vote on this? Correct. That's correct. Okay. I'm going to make it really clear. I promise you that in New York State, it is not possible to have vote on zoning by referendum. That's ridiculous. Okay. I, I didn't make the law. I will say, I will say, one thing you can do is to wait to adopt a zoning ordinance before there's been an election where this is the election issue. To wait until 2023 before adopting the zoning. I, I understand you're, you're in a little hard position. There's disagreement. We don't actually know what the majority. We don't actually know what the majority of the community thinks. It strikes me there's a lot of people who have legitimate concerns about it. Why not wait, have it be an election issue, and have a vote in 2023? That's my just view on it. But I'm Sure, yeah. So my other question was, for people who, who had put X's through that they didn't need the zoning, are they going to be fined now, or are they grandfathered in, but if their house burns down, they can't rebuild? They'd be grandfathered in. If the house burned down, they would be able to rebuild. If they want to do any expansions, they would only be able to expand up to 25%. As the, as the draft, I'm just operating off the draft that I yeah, had. Uh, they would have to undertake yeah. site plan review. Or if the use was discontinued, there was the possibility of a special use permit. Okay. Again, the zoning law is not final, and there's opportunities to make all of this stuff less bad. But even then, I would say, what happens so often is these codes get adopted, and they become stricter over time. They become exclusionary segregationist documents that make cities unaffordable and inequitable. I've seen the most, I've seen the most, I've, I've, you can do the research on any given town. Someone ordinance. here did, I'm, and if they're here, just raise your hand when I start quoting you. <laughs> but at one of our listening sessions in the 1950s, zoning was tried to to come in here. They tried to put it through, and it was 
found to be uh, segregate, segregationist. So they didn't, the town did not let them pass it. I mean, it was a big outcry about that because it would have separated races. Uh, on, on the subject of uh, zoning becoming more restrictive, it is true that, thank you, it's true that um, we've only operating on uh, Articles 1 to 4 currently, which they have gotten around to, have had the time to revise. But when you look at Articles 1 through 4, the, um, it only got more restrictive. It didn't get less restrictive from what they had prior. I read the beginning, I read after. It's not less restrictive. So it's very unlikely, it's very unlikely that the following articles, once they have them done, are going to be less restrictive than what the current draft is. There may be some less restrictive, but overall I doubt it's going to be um, less restrictive. Can you please, uh, two questions unrelated. Also, um, what do you have to say about the water resource overlays and the impact of those in our community? That's a good question. Um, so, as I argue in the book, I mean, I think the most important thing that jurisdictions should be doing is impact, regulating the specific impacts that they care about. Don't try to do this whole game where we say we're going to imagine every single possible use on every single possible parcel, or we're going to require every single change to a site to undergo site plan review where neighbors are micromanaging the plans of one another. I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that gets you planning objectives. But you know, to bring up what the, what the lady was raising earlier, something like fireworks, noise. If you have wetlands that are being developed in, right? I think it's appropriate to have regulations and rules for that. At the very least, to make sure that uh, other folks are not being put at risk or that that development is uh, responding to the local context. I think all of that's completely appropriate. Um, I don't want to speak to the water overlay because I don't. That's that. There were some details in there that I think were mostly in the second half of the ordinance, and I'm getting in trouble for talking about that. So. Um, you need to be smart about development near in wetlands, uh, FEMA designated wetlands, uh, waterways. Of course, you, you know, the, as I was just visiting the the, the Wileys their farm today. Where y'all at? There you go. And you have streams. Streams move. They're you know they can present issues. You need to be thoughtful about that. In many cases, the folks on the property actually have a very good sense of what's going on there. Um, but it's appropriate to have rules and standards for stuff like that and oversight. Uh, but zoning just goes so so far beyond that, and so much of it what it does has absolutely nothing to do with those impacts. put that as a blanket statement to protect the things that they're concerned about without having to implement zones. Yeah, yeah and I, I think that's actually, that would be a much healthier discussion in my mind. I think people understandably get uh, a little freaked out when they start hearing about, well, it's going to be highly prescribed to me, you know, um, what exactly my home might look like or what exactly businesses are going to be able to operate where uh, people, I think, understandably get skittish about that. But when you talk in terms of real impacts and things that we can measure and things where there's a consensus that it's an issue, I think that's where the planning discussion needs to be. I want to, I'm sorry, I'm in a lot of pain. I guess. First off, the 40 by a house is just to check out your neighbors. Secondly, Dwight has zoning, and a store owner over, the, over there told me when they lost power, he had to go up here before three places to get permission to find an alternative heat source. And in the meantime, mm -hmm. his pipes broke and it cost him $30,000. So there you have zoning. Secondly, I really appreciate everyone coming. We aren't worried about the 130 pages so far. We're worried about the thousand that might come after it. Jay mm -hmm. Laura. There are people that support zoning. And I drive by their house and I see or their business, and I see storage containers. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, don't you want zoning to get rid of that other guy's storage containers? So at some point, it's gonna come back to bite everybody. And if what's happened in this town is indicative of what zoning's gonna do, I'm glad I'm on my way out. I'm sorry, I gotta say it. I feel like I have to go before people and say, which one of my children do you want me to cut out of my will because you're gonna raise the three acres to five and I've only got 11 but three kids, do the math. <laughs> I mean, am I, are they Solomon? Basically, you move here, there wasn't zoning. 
you knew it when you bought the place. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Laura. So, most people have either opposition to zoning or whatever. The problem that we see is, is that nobody is justifying why to do zoning and how many people are saying we want zoning. Our town sends out an email. Should we do zoning? They get 10 responses? Yes. Send out a paper flyer to every household and justify. We've got 500 people that say we want zoning. We got 1,500 that say we don't, or vice versa. Show us the numbers. Who? What is the need for this? And, and in that flyer, ask a few questions. And I encourage everybody ask the town to do this so that they can justify it if they do pass this and say this is why we did it these are the responses we had and why or no we're not going to pass it on because these are not the necessary needs that this town has and as far as their water overlays trust the DEC and the Corps of Engineers because they dictated this years ago this is all in stone, and they will make determinations that needs to be made if it needs to be made. They have um, the data to back all this up. So we need to encourage people who are in charge of this to follow through with it and make sure that they dot their I's and cross their T's it's my fault. and justify it before it happens. Otherwise, we're going to vote them out of office and we will change this one way or another. I just wanted to go on the water overlay since it was on topic. And I know you said you can't speak to it, but I have a question for you for in your profession. Since you did planning and as a career, who did you rely on for that kind of information? Water overlays on properties, streams? <coughs> did your people on your committee do that or? Yeah, so in any rural context, it's generally been uh, county folks having to do with sewer and water. Uh, no, I'm talking about streams. A lot the streams. Of the streams. Yeah, for so rates. Would you rely on like what we have as DEC? Would you rely on their expertise to do that, or would you just have your committee decide where the water overlays are? Uh, generally, there will be a separate environmental planning or environmental protection department that has engineers do that work. Yes, yeah, it's, it's generally not something that you're going to have in the zone code. Uh, a buffer or riparian buffers, um, yes, yeah, sometimes, you know, but yeah. Sir. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for being here. I am a fifth generation landowner at the end, in the sunset of my life. And my family have been good stewards of the land. <coughs> I often have heard from the town supervisor that we can't do anything until we have a draft law in front of us. The Zoning Commission is meeting weekly to finish this draft law. Is it cast in concrete? that this draft law must come before the town board, or if it doesn't come before the town board, why couldn't the town board make a motion to table this for a year or so, or the 24 months that 1,600 of us have expressed in a petition and thank the Zoning Commission, but we're in a recession. Uh, a friend of mine who is poor just had his fuel tanks filled and he said, RC, I can't do it again. I'm going to have to get some kind of propane heaters, which will increase the chance of fire. And 
secondly, and Catherine, I really appreciate your work and your being here, but I, I take pause with your statement about the openness, and we really want to hear you. At the last town board meeting I attended, I asked Bobby Spencer to move the lectern podium over so I could use it. This was before the meeting was recorded, and the town supervisor and a town council member said, put that back, RC, we don't need that. We don't, the privilege of the floor people don't need the safety and sanctity of something to rest their papers on or to hide their shaking life. So I didn't, I, I stopped going. And I think the attendance at the town board meetings has drastically diminished. Apparently at the next town board meeting, one of our, our citizens made a fairly impassioned plea with the town board. And we often in the audience say thank you. This was forbidden. And now we can't even recognize our fellow neighbors when they make a point. It's, it's getting ugly mm -hmm. and it's sad. Right. Thank you. I just had a couple of things that I think might help us all feel a little better. Um, there are three pieces of legislation right now that address zoning, and these folks are talking about loosening or getting rid of because they are finding it very arbitrary. They're very concerned about the sh uh, very small held power and how people can, if, you know, oh, I don't like your project, but he's my buddy, I'm going to let it go. Um, so there is legislation that they're looking at it at a state level. Um, and the other thing is we get frustrated with the, the zoning commission or the town board. What I really wish would have happened is in the beginning that they would have expressed that this is really being driven by Tuckins County. They could have taken a lot less heat had they said the county is really pushing us to do this because they have a grant and they have time, things that they need done. And as part of a comprehensive plan, in the whole county um, so it's really being steered by the county as much as we don't want it and i'm all for not having it um, it's 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 at a county level so i really think that some of our um, passion could kind of get steered that way that that might have a positive impact can you, can you cite anything that would help us to find where we can find more information about that absolutely i'll be happy yeah. to email you what i have okay so I just I would just wanted to share that so that maybe yeah. we could find I, 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 a little for that context. Hope. Yeah, no, that's important. I mean, I understand that the county has uh, accepted some EPA grant that, and one of their objectives was that um, Caroline needs to adopt zoning. But you know what? This is a democracy. Um, the, just because the grant says it doesn't mean that the town board has to do, has to do it. Um, I would also add that if you've been to town boards throughout the years and listened to them. Oh, we're going to, we can do it first. Hey, let's do this thing because we want to be first. Well, we want to be first. You know what? Let's be first to say, no, we're not going to do it. Yeah. Let's do a couple more here. Maybe go to 815, sir. I have a couple of questions, but that actually made me want to jump up and just point out um, I used to work at the county in planning, and I can say unequivocally, there is zero push from the county for a municipality to adopt a law. It's not the way the department operates. It's not what they do. It's absolutely not happening. Um, but what I want to ask you about, actually, is if you have examples of towns that you think are doing a very good job of planning that are addressing um, some of the concerns that don't have zoning, and particularly because I think a lot of places um, they see zoning as a four letter word and then they adopt a land use code or a land use ordinance that controls lot size and 
all of those things, and they pass it. They don't call it zoning because zoning is just a bunch of laws. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering what places you would look to as uh, good examples of a town similar size and kind of context to this that, are, Caroline. that are doing good things. Yeah, it's a nice place. Yeah. It's working now. Well, I'm, I'm asking for yeah. some examples. Well, thanks for the question. Um, let me get back to you. Um, good examples for comps. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I know I've, I've worked in planning, or have interacted with council members in planning context, in many planning contexts where they don't have zoning. They have generally a grab bag of zoning ordinance, or uh, impact related ordinances that reflect the local concerns. So maybe you have the crazy neighbor who's popping up the fireworks and they adopt the fireworks ordinance. You know, in general, like, you, it's, I think, I don't think there's a standard formula here. Generally, Cities will adopt some cocktail of, of ordinance rules that reflect the impacts that are of concern to communities. Um, but a good comp for Carolyn, yeah. Uh, let me look into that. That's and, probably like yeah. the single most important question to be asked, mm. right? Like just looking for a good comp. And yeah. many of us have been looking and looking and looking and looking. So I would so appreciate if you could help us with that. Sure. Looking and looking and looking. All right, let's be respectful. Sorry. Yes, one of the things that maybe a lot of people here might not realize, when Dollar General first going to come, they put up a moratorium to stop any commercial uh, development, and they started a task force for site plan review to make uh, what the what what new facades would have to look like, what a parking lot where it had to be all these type of things and I, I don't know just how many pages that was it was quite large when it went to the town board mm -hmm. the town board I believe has tabled it with the idea that that uh, task force agreed that zoning would have to happen in order to put all that in place and Catherine was on that task force, so... No, I was not. You what? I was not. Bullshit! I was on it myself! You were on it! No. All right, please no, 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 no. Sir, I was yes. not on our task force. All right. Uh, anybody got a short one here? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, one thing I... Observation I would share is there's been a, a lot of talk about preserving Caroline's uh, rural character. And I, and I think that's actually something that there's general consensus about. Um, but the thing that I would say is that, you know, that rural character exists because for the last 200 years, people have had the freedom and flexibility to adapt and evolve and change and strive and, and figure out a way to make a living and, and uh, prosper. Um, and I would put it in stark contrast to a place like Lansing um, that has large lot zoning. It, it is, they've, they've protected suburbia and they have foisted suburbia on the landscape out there and, you know, for some people, that's fine. Um, but I think what the folks in Caroline are saying is, we like our rural character, and we know how to keep our rural character. We keep it by keeping the freedom and flexibility that it, we have always had. Additionally, I would say there's been some talk about, um, you know, the you know, environmental things. The reality is all the environmental, whether it's streams, whether it's floodplains, whether it's wetlands, whether it's stormwater management, septic, well, all these sorts of things, there are already regulations in place at the state and federal level, many of which are enforced by the county, that are already taking care of all those things. Zoning is absolutely not needed for environmental protection. It just isn't. So that's all I'd say. Well, there's more questions here. I'll, I'll stick around. You can bum rush me at the end. One more? Okay. One more. Very quick. 
a woman over there asked about a referendum, why they can't have zoning on the referendum. I'm John White, and I'm from the town of Hector, and this looks just like our fire halls. We've had the same identical meetings, and I'm a retired a school board member, uh, retired a town board member, and in my absence, a zoning came up, and when they said they couldn't put it on a referendum, I'm running for supervisor under the no zoning banner. <laughs> and the folks here, you are my inspiration to jump into this. So do what you got to do. Great. Well, um, thanks for coming. I know it's a heated, tough discussion. Um, keep it respectful. Keep it friendly. I know it's tough. Um, I don't have all the answers, no. uh, but I have one answer. I know zoning is not part of the answer for a lot of these problems. Um, we've seen it happen. You know what happens when it gets adopted. We've played through this in communities all across the country. You end up with communities that are unaffordable, inequitable, segregated, and stagnant. You, get, you end up with a very small group of people imposing their vision on the community to the detriment of everybody else. It's the opposite of democracy. It's the opposite of preserving character in any meaningful sense. Character is something that's built by individual people living their individual lives. Um, uh, if you want more of the answers, uh, my book's for sale. And <laughs> <laughs> all seriousness, I'll thank you all for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, folks, uh, real quick, um, I definitely want to thank Nolan and his whole crew for coming out here. Thanks a ton. Uh, especially want to thank all you folks for coming out tonight. And most of all, thank you for the fire um, hall crew for letting us come in here tonight the night before last night. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. No, there's no one's books available on Amazon, just saying. <laughs> John. Hey, I'm going there. You went for an hour. So really, I'm still working.